course the reason why I'm doing this video is because of the freshly released RSA 306 real-time USB 3.0 spectrum analyzer but keep in mind that signal view is used for all kinds of other instruments like the uh, also recently released MDO 4000 so uh, this video may be useful for you with all kinds of Tektronics instruments not just the RSA 306 Okay, so uh, to get started, and of course we're going to use the RSA 306, you need to install the software, and it's pretty straightforward. I did make a video of it, but unfortunately the uh, footage got lost um, using Cam Studio, and it somehow screwed up, and it's all gone, and I'm not going to uninstall and reinstall it, but it's just, you basically click next a bunch of times, leave all check marks that are automatically checked, checked, and... Uh, just uh, go through the process very easy straightforward okay now I got signal view installed I have my RSA 306 hooked up and I have the RF output from the demo board connected into the input of the RSA 306 right now we're just putting out a continuous tone at a let's call it frequency X I know the frequency but I'll show that we have ways of figuring this frequency out so um, before we even go into connecting to the instrument and all that, let's talk about licenses for a second. If you click on tools, uh, you can click on manage licenses and you see that there's entries for different licenses. Like the top one here is the SignalView Education License, which basically enables all sub-licenses. And if you have a license key, you can enter this at a different location, which I will show in a moment. Or you can click here to start a 30-day evaluation. And what's really nice is that you can start this evaluation for each and every single license individually. So you don't have to commit to everything at once. If you just want to test one thing after another or just use one thing when you actually need it, you can do that. You just hit start 30-day evaluation and uh, it actually shows you the time remaining. Let's see if we uh, pick anything else. Here we go, evaluation, 14 days remaining. Now if you do have a license key, then you click on tools and activate license. Enter your license key right here. It does require an internet connection, but and just hit OK and it takes a few seconds and it'll tell you that the license has successfully activated. That's it. All right, first thing, first time you connect an instrument, you want to click on live link and search for instruments and it's checking your local USB ports and your Ethernet for all kinds of compatible instruments. So if you have more than one instrument uh, hooked up like uh, my MDO 4000, if it's started up and connected to the Wi-Fi, it actually does show up in this list. Here it says found instrument RSA 306 on USB 0 and now we can click here and say connect to instrument. It's connecting right now. That takes a second or two. or a little bit longer than that. All right, there we go. So, um, this is obviously not real time, this is way too slow. This is full span center frequency, it says right down here. It's 3.1 gigahertz and the span is 6.2 gigahertz. Now remember for the RSA 306, the real time bandwidth is uh, 40 megahertz. But we can already figure out where our CW signal is. Um, Hopefully, let's actually, I don't see it where I'm expecting it. Uh, well, I am, sorry. I just didn't look at the, um, at the, uh, no, what's it called here? The frequency per division. Let's see, we can use some peak markers to figure this out, though, and it jumps automatically to the highest peak, which is at 2.44125 gigahertz, it says. So we can hit to center. Now we have our spectrum centered around that, and we're missing some spectrum here, obviously, because it's below 0 kilohertz, or, well, it starts at 9 kilohertz, but in theory, it shows still 0. Now, uh, if we go into settings, we can set up our resolution bandwidth, and here's our span, which is currently set to 6.2 gigahertz. I'm going to reduce that to, uh, let's make that 10 megahertz. Oops. Something broke. Well, let's uh, try it again. 10 megahertz. Enter. And 
Okay, it lost the connection, so let's reestablish our connection. I don't know why that broke. It's the first time that happened to me, but we can just easily reconnect. All right, there we go. Now, obviously, our frequency was a little bit off. We can go back to markers, hit peak, and pull that to center. And now it looks like we actually have our peak here at 2.4453 gigahertz in the center. If we click on the settings button again, we can adjust our resolution bandwidth. If we pull that to 10 kilohertz, now, yeah, we see this nice CW peak tone there in the middle. Um, what you can select here, you can select the, the filter shape for the FFT. Let's do a Hanning window. It won't look very different here for the CW tone. The standard is a Kaiser window. Um, you have the option to select different traces or select different modes for the primary trace. Like right now, we have a positive peak. We can do negative peak, we can do an average. Uh, we have sample detection. We have all kinds of options here. The default is positive peak. And we can add a function like average or we can do a max hold. Default is normal. That's what you just saw. And we can add another trace. So actually, we can add multiple traces. We can even do math here. And let's take the second trace, click Show. And let's make that a max hold. Seems like that was the default. And you see we got two nice traces here. And uh, one thing you need to be certain is if you have trace 2 selected now and you go back to your markers, the marker will be on trace 2. And sometimes it'll mess you up. If you disable the second trace and the marker is for that other trace, it'll actually give you an error message where the marker will show here that it's not enabled and you're wondering where your marker went. So let's go back to this normal trace here. And we're seeing our CW tone at 2.4453 gigahertz. So no big rocket science here yet, but let me change the uh, demo board to put out a, a QPSK signal. And there it is. And by the bandwidth, we can kind of guesstimate the uh, symbol rate. If we look at this, it's about 1 megahertz per division, so we're somewhere close to 4 megahertz in bandwidth. And at uh, QPSK signal, actually at most uh, multi re uh, PSK modes, it uh, the bandwidth does correspond to the symbol rate if it's properly filtered and in this case it is so uh, obviously we want to look at some of the details of this QPSK signal and that's a great opportunity to show how to set up your window so you're going to set up click into display and here you get to select what type of windows you want to see and we've seen the spectrum so let's remove it let's look at the digital phosphor display looks a whole lot more fancy Mm, let's see what else we're going to do. We can pull the spectrogram out of the DPX window too, so uh, we're just going to leave that the way it is. Then digital modulation, uh, let's get a constellation diagram, mm, eye diagram, symbol table. Those are good ones, and by the way, each and one of those categories here is a license on its own. And this general signal viewing is a free license that, well, now is free. It used to cost a lot of money, almost $2,000 beforehand. Now it's free. I'm not sure if that's limited to the RSA 306 or if that's for all tectonics instruments. But in either case, it's a steep reduction in price. And each one of those uh, subsections here is an extra license. And it has some very fancy stuff like the APCO 25 analysis. That's a digital communication standard used by law enforcement. And it has some application presets too. I mean, we can play with this. Um, uh, all kinds of stuff, interesting pulse analysis, modulation analysis here. Uh, that's pretty much what we just have selected, except it has the signal quality in here uh, instead of the eye diagram. But you can just say, okay, you want to do modulation analysis, hit OK. And it's going to rearrange the windows. And normally this is a whole lot faster. The only reason this is so slow uh, is because I also have Cam Studio record in the background here. And it does use a lot of processor here in the background. I can really tell that it's slowed down. Now, there's a couple of things. Now that I hit that uh, preset, it forgot our frequency here. And so I'm going to enter that again. It was 2.4453. Uh, 
gigahertz. I leave the reference level at zero dBm. And you see, we see our constellation diagram here. We see uh, the four points right here, the four levels of the QPSK. We see our symbol table here. It's always uh, two bits per symbol. That's perfectly fine. And we see our signal quality up here. Our RMS error vector magnitude is right now somewhere around 5%. And we also see yellow bars. And if we move our mouse over it, it says unaligned data. Okay, uh, that is because we didn't align the instrument. That's really easy to do. And I saw in a different review video that was uploaded uh, not too long ago, the uh, person reviewing this instrument and the software forgot to mention this. And this is very important. You click on tools and alignments and when you do that, it'll tell you to turn off or disconnect the RF input signal before running the alignment. So I'm going to disconnect our RF input. And I'll click Align Now and give it a minute. And reconnect the signal. And our error message is gone. This is really neat. And uh, let's look at the uh, setups. You can either click here on Setup, or you can click here on the Settings button directly. And uh, it, it really depends on what window you set your mouse into, what options you have down here. But some options are shared. Like if you click on the Spectrum, you have your center frequency and all that. But here if you go in the Signal Quality window, as well as the Constellation and Symbol Table window, it wants to know what the modulation type is. And it has QPSK here pre-selected. And it wants to know the symbol rate. And it appears to have guessed that correctly. It's uh, approximately correct. We saw that just from the spectrum alone. And you can set filter parameters. And this one was actually given as 0 0.35. All right, that didn't change much. And you can select what type of filter it is. You can select your own filters or define your own filters. Then we have the frequency and bandwidth a measurement bandwidth and it's all set on auto and in general I have found that signal view is really good with its auto functions just auto scale and auto everything is really good just at the DPX display if we look at the color for instance if we click on it and then we click down here in the settings on bitmap scale we click on auto color it changes the coloration the color temperature and all that depending on the uh, the uh, actual spectrum present and you have different schemes here, like uh, just a plain green with gradients, a binary cyan. This is a bunch of things. You have a spectral type one, and uh, you have the one that we just seen, which is called temperature. It's pretty neat. Um, you can select a whole bunch of other things down here. Really, the options are almost endless, but we don't want to get too deep in it. It's just supposed to be a general overview. Now, let's say you're making a measurement such as this and you want to actually store your result. Number one, you can stop the acquisition. You can do a single shot capture and it'll store that. So if you click on it again, it'll only single shot it. And if you want to store this, like you know, as a screenshot, just a whole general overview, you can click on File, Save As. And then down here, it determines what you're actually storing. You can store the setup you can store the general screenshot as a picture. You can do PNG, JPEG, or BMP, bitmap. You can export your results, your measurements. Uh, you can export it really in a variety type of data uh, formats. It's really nice and different picture formats. Uh, be careful with the pictures. I have found that some of those look kind of dull and others look sharper. So you really have to experiment with that. I think it was PNG that looked a whole lot sharper than JPEG. JPEG looked very heavily compressed. And obviously it is more compressed, but it really looked like it. It didn't look pretty. It lost lots of color depth and things like that. OK, that's just a general overview uh, where to find your markers, your traces, and things like that. Now let's uh, decode some FM radio. So in order to listen to FM radio, I have disconnected the uh, test board and I have connected the included rubber duck antenna. So uh, we're going to reconfigure signal view here. Let's click on displays and let's remove that one. Actually, let's remove everything. And all we really need is the spectrum. 
and we could do some analog modulation stuff like FM analysis and this sort of stuff, but I'm not going to bother with that. We're just going to look at this plain spectrum. I'm going to go into the FM radio band, and I know there's a radio station at 100.3, and it's megahertz, not gigahertz. And reference level should go down. Let's, I don't know, let's do negative 50 dBm. And then let's put it into continuous mode. All right, we see a bunch of radio stations there. Resolution bandwidth, let's get that down. Let's do 10 kilohertz. Here we go, here we see all the peaks. Uh, maybe let's take a different one. Cause that one looks kind of crowded there. Let's do markers, peak. That one looks kind of good. That's the highest peak. Just in case you missed it earlier, all you do is markers hit peak. And you can click to the right, get the next peak over into that direction. Or you can hit left, get the next marker, uh, next peak into that direction. It's really straightforward. It's really easy to figure out. Um, you can actually uh, add more markers. Just click here, click on Add Marker. And you can add a bunch of markers on your on your screen here, no problem. And you can also center your spectrum around this marker. Just hit to center. All of a sudden, we get our radio station in the middle. Now we can uh, reduce our span, which is at 40 megahertz. Let's reduce it to 10. There we go. We got our radio station jumping around in the middle. And if we wanted to listen to it, we can. Now, I'll warn you, on this laptop, it will probably not work very smoothly. It has an AMD A8 in here, and it normally works very well, but with the screen capture software, it's a little bit complicated. Mm, it's, nope, that was not the right one. We click into um, Setup, Audio. Down here, it has an Audio Demod field. And it only has a very limited amount of demodulation settings. It has AM with 8 kilohertz bandwidth, and then FM with 8, 13, 75, and 200 kilohertz. And I was really surprised by that. I hope tech is going to change this. It's going to give you more options, at least being able to uh, define your own bandwidth, your own modulation depth would be really nice. And then I don't know. I, I mean, they are capturing IQ data, so I don't know why they can't offer at least simple things like single sideband, uh, uh, double sideband, and things like that in general with, with the ability to actually define modulation parameters. That would be very nice. And I can't imagine that that's too difficult for them to do. We can listen to it or you can store it to a file. So let's say if you're interference hunting out in the field somewhere and you found something and you just want to record how it sounds for evidence purposes or something like that, you can just uh, select a file, activate this, and then you hit run. In this case, we're just going to try to listen to it through the speaker. And like I said, it, it won't be very clear simply because of the limitations of this laptop. So, But let's give it a listen. All right, very well. So you see it does demodulate um, that. No problem. Well, it means no problem. There is a problem, obviously, the computer. But uh, let's see if we find something in the air band. I think it was 135.4, which is the approach control frequency from a uh, tower around here. Let's try 119.5. Now, of course, there's not much we can listen to if nobody's talking, but that's just showing, for example, how you can use the demodulation uh, here. Uh, another thing to look at would be the two point, let's say, four or five gigahertz area. And that's actually something that's better for our digital phosphor. We remove that, add our DPX back in, uh, same settings here. Let's get the span back up to 40. And there we go. We see Wi-Fi signals, lots of Wi-Fi signals. And that here in the middle is, I would suspect, from the uh, demo board. Yep, if we remove that, that's gone. 
and it sometimes will say down here data acquired during uh, RF ADC overage and that's no surprise because when my laptop tries to join the Wi-Fi or send out packages obviously this blasts everything else around here away uh, especially since we're so close to the laptop so that's no surprise but in either case uh, actually one more thing that we haven't shown yet uh, we can get this nice view so that you actually get to see in the time domain the intensity of those signals like those bursts like the ones that are showing up here you can neatly see here in the time domain on this axis now that's extremely nice but I don't really want to get into every single window because for the most part they're self-explanatory this was just supposed to be a quick video of how to navigate through here how to do some of the basics and uh, that, that's pretty much it another thing is if you disconnect from an instrument and you have already had this instrument connected to your laptop beforehand or to your computer you will find it in this list connect to instrument it will list previous instruments on there so uh, if my MDO 4000 would have been on after I uh, installed the software on this laptop you would see the MDO 4000 listed in here too and if for some odd reason the search fails especially on an Ethernet device you can click here and enter the IP address manually sometimes that's necessary when I used a bunch of Wi-Fi extenders basically across the uh, entire house I needed to do that once because I uh, just didn't like the way I had it set up uh, but that's the quick intro that's the quick overview of the Tektronix signal view PC software if you have any questions or comments or if you would like to see anything more specific just post your questions down below in the comment section I will try to make a more specific video on that but in either case I hope uh, whether you're using the RSA uh, 306 or any other Tektronix instrument this video has helped you getting started with the signal view software and I hope you subscribe to my channel give this video a big thumbs up and I'll see you next time.